Those were the days we used to run. Hands up, hands up, straight for the sun. Just conversation, no second thought. Our hands up. My face above the water. My feet can't touch the ground, touch the ground, and it feels like I can see the sands on the horizon every time. You are not around. I'm slowly drifting away, wave after wave, wave after wave. Slowly drifting, drifting away. And it feels like I'm drowning, pulling against the stream, pulling against the stream.
so we have done that in my Heavy Chef song. I just want to have a quick note to say that that was written by my very good friend Divine Mahara and a very talented individual called Aaron Halevi, who I think is actually watching tonight. So, hola, Aaron Halevi, and uh, respect to um, to Divine Mahara. If anyone's interested in his musical stylings, go and check him out on all streaming channels. We're supporting him. He. Uh, He's written all the music and the backtracks, all the content for Heavy Chef. So, um, welcome guys. This is bizarre to see real people in a real setting. So, that's applause for you guys uh, for being brave. There are a lot of people who, um, who preferred respectfully to, to stay at home and, uh, and we are indeed living in incredibly strange and unusual times and so with that in mind we have an event tonight entitled Future Starts Now. Uh, it's very apt I believe and it coincides with a book that's been produced, published, edited, co-written by Bronwyn Williams uh, who's sitting in the, in the corner there uh oh! <laughs> I sneezed. I sneezed in the gym earlier this morning, and like, it was like the whole place to stop. It was like, here's that guy. So, don't worry. You're in, a, you're in a safe, you're in a safe space. I'm making you feel as awkward as I did earlier. So, um, welcome, welcome to all of you here. Um, in in what is probably one of the strangest. Uh, 18 months of my life, uh, being the CEO of Heavy Chef, which is an education platform, part of which is predicated on getting a whole bunch of people in close proximity to each other in small groups of people, which obviously has been fairly challenging for Heavy Chef as a business. So, um, with that said, it's also been an incredibly fruitful and uh, an enriching year for us as a team, for the Heavy Chef team, it's just been amazing. We managed to accelerate the launch of our education platform. So if anyone is interested, a little bit of a sales pitch, and not too much, I hope. Um, go and check out heavychef.com. Sign up, it's free uh, for 30 days. You can go and check out some all-you-can-eat pass, which includes the events and the small groups, the resources, and, um, and all the recipes, the recipes for entrepreneurs, that we provide. For those of you who haven't been to Heavy Chef events before, what we do is pretty much that. We provide recipes for entrepreneurs. We break down how to be an entrepreneur into small bite-sized chunks and we want to be the best in the world at doing that in order to inspire people to start new projects and empower them to succeed. So essentially it's all about serving entrepreneurs. We believe that entrepreneurs can save the world for the better and, uh, and impact the world in such a way that's more efficient and, and faster and more scalable than potentially waiting for top-down change, which Lord knows we can be waiting for a long time. If we affect or impact or at least play a small part in contributing to that bottom-up change, then, um, then we will feel like we've done a good job. So I'm, um, I'm really, really pleased to be able to start the process of getting people together again and start to coalesce and really bring together people around this enriching content that's been created by 
all these amazing people, these heavy chefs, uh, the people who are eating their own food, who are rolling up their sleeves, who are getting stuck in, um, you know, digging the trenches, doing their 10,000 hours, and really actually doing rather than talking. And we believe in a world of talkers, it's the doers that are going to change it. So that's you guys. And you guys, we just want to really honor everybody here in the room, people who are doing projects, who are getting involved, who are getting stuck in, just to keep going. And hopefully through this kind of content, through these kind of conversations, that this will play a small part in your journey, your success, and, and inspire you just to keep going, because Lord knows it can be pretty tough at times. Part of our, our service is really offering uh, benefits to our community of um, at the moment we, we're growing over 40,000 people within our, our community um, and uh, the uh, the whole platform would not be possible if it weren't for the support of our amazing partners so first and foremost um, respect to pay fast uh, to uh, the the, one of our most long-standing partners and um, and the founder is in the room today who I know he doesn't want to be picked out of the crowd but John Smith respect to you my man uh, John has been with us from the beginning and uh, has built such an incredible company and we're so proud of you and also to the support that you've shown entrepreneurs just through the ages and, and you know in terms of what in the digital sense has been an age and really helped us to to provide that support to all of you guys um, also zero which is uh, as as we as those of you who've used it is the world's best accounting software and workshop 17 and whose facility we're using today with this unbelievable view and again it's so nice to be out out and about um, also respect to whipping the cat uh, retail capital yoko uh, ex nilo the the, by far the best and uh, and the biggest uh, hosting partner in uh, in South Africa, Digital Planet HP, that recently come aboard. There's big discounts on HP products, which is amazing. And then our lifestyle partners, Baxberg, so Fruit, and Good Leaf over there, which won't get you high. I've already had that question a few times tonight, um, but it does make you pretty chilled, which is also good. Um, and bigger, particularly to our latest, brightest, shiniest, newest partner, Creed Living, um, who has just this month joined us as a partner, as a lifestyle partner, uh, to, uh, to help our entrepreneurs and our community be more healthy. And we have Roxy Davis in the house. Yes! Ex heavy chef speaker in the back there. Roxy, stand up. Can we please give Roxy Davis nine times South African stand up? Round of applause. Nine times South African surfing champion, and I think, I believe I'm correct in saying the only person in South Africa uh, to have worn five different Springbok blazers in five different disciplines. Did I say that right? Yes, you're shaking it. So she's amazing, she's a rock star, she's absolutely incredible, and she's in charge of just such a fantastic company. So you'll see at the back there, sorry for those of you <laughs> who are chiming in from your home, but you can also. Uh, take advantage of uh, Creed Living through the Heavy Shift platform, but there's a bunch of little takeaway packets, so everyone please take one away with you. There's a bunch of goodies in there, including collagen, which who knew uh, changes lives. I, don't know, I didn't even know what collagen was before I met Roxy, but now I feel like I can move and my joints are free and it's, it's just great. So I put in my coffee and my tea and all that kind of stuff. I sound like an old man, but it's awesome. So, um, thank you Creed Living for the support. And then just, uh, uh, I just want to say before we get started tonight, um, a huge thanks to my team. So, this is the first Inspire session that we've had, we're having in a year in Cape Town. We had one in Joburg two weeks ago. It was messy, it was glitchy. <laughs> None of the technology worked the way we wanted it to be. Well, then it's freaking lucky because our mics didn't work. There was an internet outage outside of Durban or something where like, we couldn't get the live stream working. So I'm hoping that people are actually watching this at home and going, this sounds better than two weeks ago. Our aim with these events 
um, I think a year and a bit ago, we were having events in Joburg to like 500 people. So I think we've got about 40, 40 odd people, 45 people maybe in the crew, in the crowd tonight. So, um, so our aim is to figure out how to do this in this brave new world, how to do these hybrid events, how to have a bunch of people in a room and to project that live to a much broader audience. Uh, so feedback appreciated. Um, we do have we are, we do have people in the audience who are going to be taking questions from the live audience. Uh, so if anyone in the live audience, in the in the virtual audience, has any questions, please tweet them hashtag HeavyChef, um, and we'll we'll field. Uh, those questions uh, to our speakers a little bit later. So um, without further ado, I would like to welcome the amazing Bronwyn Williams back onto the Heavy Chef stage. Can we please give her a big round of applause? Firstly, a massive thanks to Fred and the team here at Heavy Chef for inviting me back to speak to you about my favorite topic, which is, of course, the future. And uh, th we're supposed to be having kind of a book launch here tonight, but because it's 2021 and nothing quite works as planned, we don't actually have the book itself. I swear it does exist. You can get it in stores in the UK, and you will get a code at the end of this from Fred and his team if you do want to purchase an online copy, because that's all we've got available due to the amazing smart supply chain sort of issues that have taken place across the globe due to the chaos that has happened over the last year. But it actually is quite an apt story not to have the book here, because it's not about the book at all. It's actually about the fact that we're trying to get a message across that the future has become very sort of commoditized into very, very few hands. We seem to have lost track of the future altogether. And here we are gathered on May the 4th, of course, with <laughs> Star Wars. We had to throw one out because Afraid chose this date specifically. And we used to be excited about the future. And we seem to stop becoming excited about the future quite soon after this movie was in fact made. If we sort of cast our minds back around about 100 years or so, we were having world fairs across the world. We were talking about fantastic ideas like colonizing space and having flying cars and all those wonderful, fantastic sort of Jetsons contraptions that were going to change our lives. And we were excited about where we were headed as humanity. And what's happened is that we have stopped being excited about the future. There's sort of a dark cloud that has descended upon humanity in general. And the people seem very convinced that tomorrow is going to be worse than today. That progress is somehow stopped. That this is as good as it gets. And we term this thing in the future's world, this concept of postalgia, which I spoke about at Heavy Chef last year. This concept of this is as good as it gets, so we might as well sort of put all of our effort into today. But that, of course, is a self-perpetuating, vicious cycle. When we don't believe in anything ahead of us, we make short-sighted decisions, which only make things even worse going ahead into the future. And worse than that, we've sort of lost our visions and our dreams. Essentially, we're still sort of running off, as my co-editor on this sort of book project that we put together, Theo Priestley likes to say, we're running on sort of second-hand futures. We're still trying to actualize the ideas that our great-grandparents came up with in 1910 and 1920. And we don't seem to have any new ideas as to what comes next. And the reasons for that are, well, I mean, look at this. Instead of having flying cars and instead of having space hotels and all those wonderful things, instead, this is kind of the future that we have among us right now. We don't have a flying car. We do have a sort of a, a trolley on a, on, a, on a thread there through a very dystopian city in China. I mean, like, that's not particularly exciting. So, so what happened there? Alternatively, because of course we don't like to pick only on totalitarian regimes, we can also look <laughs> on the other side of the world at what's happening in San Francisco. This is the new dream that we all get to aspire to. This is what we are telling children of today that their sort of white picket fence will be. This is a company called Podshare in Silicon Valley, sort of pinnacle of Western civilization and development. And what it is, you can see there, there are sort of six bunk beds over there. They each have someone's name, Shells, Sarah at the top of there. And each of these people are around about my age. They're millennial generation. They're in their late 20s. They're white collar professionals. They have arrived. They've done everything right. And yet they are staying and living in those bunk beds. That is their entire apartment. And they pay around about the equivalent, depending on whatever the Rand exchange rate is doing this week, or around about 18,000 Rand a month for the privilege of that bunk bed. That's not particularly aspirational. 
So whether you live in a developed world and you're a young person, or whether you live in a developing world and you're a young person, there's this sense that how are, we, are our lives going to be better in the future, that somehow we've sort of reached an end point, that it only gets worse from here. And I think that's a very destructive narrative. It's definitely not a narrative we should be selling. How can you get excited about a, a degrowth, the shrunk horizons future? Of course, you've got the other sort of option here. So if you can't afford ever to own your own house because you're going to spend your entire salary renting a bunk bed, you can also sort of start to invest in the virtual world. This is Decentraland and crypto voxels and all those wonderful crypto projects where they're not making any more land in the real world, but they sure are releasing an awful lot of it in the virtual space. So you can buy these plots for up to hundreds of thousands of dollars. You can spend real money on a virtual apartment, which quite frankly doesn't look that much more exciting than the real life cities that I showed you at the beginning. But this is kind of all we've got to offer people. You're never gonna get what you want in the real world, but maybe perhaps you can have some plots of land in a virtual sphere and that should be good enough for you. Essentially, what all these different sort of illustrations that I put together show you is that we're sort of heading towards a sort of please sir, may I have some more kind of future, whereby we're never going to be able to own our own lives and our own destinies, and instead we should settle for sort of low bar utopias, things like grants for everyone in South Africa or universal basic income if you're fancy, which is pretty much the same thing of saying that we're unable to actually achieve anything worth working towards as individuals that we should rather settle for being sort of taken care of by someone. Or as the World Economic Forum likes to say, you'll have no, you'll own nothing, have no privacy, and your life will never be better. You won't have to worry about anything, don't worry, we'll take care of it. We'll take care of you, and if you're not going to get exactly fully automated luxury communism, you might get sort of fully automated, maybe sort of lower middle class communism to kind of look forward to. So don't worry, you'll survive, you'll be okay, you'll get your bunk bed, but you must just give up on the future and let us take care of you. This seems to be the narrative that we are being fed really from every direction, from people in the technosphere and politicians and all the big voices seem to be telling us these same messages. We must sort of settle for a lesser future ahead. And what I want to question you tonight is to say, really, is that what we really want? Are we excited about that? Are we prepared to settle for that sort of comfort and security, to give up on progress and to settle for sort of sharing what we already have? And that's the first thing I want you to think about, but it's also worth thinking about what's happened to futurism itself, thinking about painting pictures about the future. We used to have very exciting ideas. As I opened with, the world's, the world's fair, all those wonderful science fiction magazines, if you, if you look at that from the sort of Art Deco era, the 1930s, the 1940s, were full of exciting ideas. When we talk about the future right now, whether you're speaking to people who work in the crypto space, the sort of decentralized libertarians, whether you're talking to people who work in the big international organizations like the UN, somehow all the sorts of journeys that we're heading towards in the midterm future are some sort of version of, of this sort of neo-feudal system whereby the elites kind of take care of us and everyone else sort of lives out of sight and out of mind outside of the, the walls of the garden and that we have to sort of attach our futures to someone who's going to be able to protect us financially and physically or physically and physically as, as I like to say over there. That seems to be a sort of best offer on the table. So what's happened to our dreams as to where we're heading next? And if we look even further ahead, it gets even worse. And I do work in the future space for a career. That's like my actual job. I get to be a futurist. It actually pays the bills, believe it or not. But when we talk to people who look at the future on a day-to-day -day basis, it almost seems that people don't want to look too far ahead because there's a sort of unsaid elephant in the room that all paths humanity is going down are leading to some sort of black hole singularity event either to our futures sort of being subsumed by some sort of artificial intelligence or because climate change will extinguish all of us or some sort of disaster is just around the corner. People who work in the space don't want to look too far ahead because they're sort of saying it all ends badly, which is also, once again, not something you can get people particularly excited about. It's much easier to get people excited about a Star Wars future, about colonizing the stars and doing exciting things and about progress rather than about regress. And we want to really challenge that because this can't be the only narrative on the table. And that's why we put this book together and that's also why I didn't write the book myself because that would kind of be quite ironic if I was 
spoon feeding people into what the future should be. So instead what we did is we got together 20 very, very different people from all across the world from very different backgrounds. Some are career academics, others are professionals, others are business owners, and others are people like myself who spend most of their time just thinking about what could happen, what could go wrong, and what could go right. And we asked them all to write essentially a letter to everyone else describing what it is that's keeping them awake at night and to catch everyone else up, and that includes yourself, with the conversations that are being had at the frontiers of these various different industries. But that's, again, only the starting point. We need more choices, we need more visions as to where the future is headed. We need more people working on those projects to start to actualize them. But 20 voices, once again, not enough. We absolutely need even more stories. We don't want second hand and one size fits all futures because any sort of utopia or prescriptive future that we're working towards is of course a dystopia for someone else. Not all of us agree about everything. In fact, not all of us agree about anything. We need more options, not less options. We need to rebroaden those horizons ahead of us. And that's why we need also not just we need new ideas, not just extensions of old ideas. And this is a challenge to business owners in the room here tonight. Because from my perspective, as someone who is, has the luxury of being able to basically observe all of you for a living, is that we kind of have two types of businesses. One type of business accelerates the distribution of the future. So they sort of distributive businesses. Great examples here would be your platform-based economies and your big tech companies that essentially are market providers, so they, they provide a marketplace for the rest of us to buy and sell goods. These distribute the future and they accelerate that distribution, but they don't necessarily build something new in a new direction. The other type of businesses are businesses that are actually progressing where we are heading to next. And right now there is definitely an opportunity in that space. We have a lack of leadership, which is very apparent in the world today when even Elon Musk is, instead of investing in his own businesses, is rather sort of putting his spare cash into cryptocurrency because that's what he believes is really the best way he's going to get return, that's a sign and a symptom of a world that's run out of new ideas. It's looking for people that are going to do whatever is coming next, to design the next wave of where we are headed, to come up with those new pictures. And there are signs and signals that we could be getting back to a world that is actually going to be progressing into new things, We've got China looking at actually putting up space elevators. We've got space hotels, like you can see on the screen over there, that will be coming up around about the year 2027. So even if we, ca it will be available within our lifetime, if not within our budget, that we actually are doing new things, not just really distributing what we have already come up with, those old sort of recycled ideas. And that's the challenge, to come up with what are we going to do next, where are we going to go next, that is not some sort of neo-feudal dystopia, not some sort of singularity black hole, what are the other good ideas on the table? And where do those ideas come from? They're not coming from the big tech companies and the big government leaders that we already have. They're going to come from people like you and I, from all of us getting involved in conversations as to where Spaceship Earth is headed. And we need more of those voices on the table. We need more pictures, we need more ideas because maybe you're satisfied with those pictures that I've painted tonight. I certainly am not. I think we can do a whole lot better. And that's why the future really needs all of us to get involved in these conversations, to actually push back on things that we don't want, and to be proactive about supporting the various different policies that are available to us. This means that we get to not just vote for the politicians that we have, but we also get to vote with our time and our attention and our money. We make many, many choices every day that nudges our spaceship Earth in a particular direction? Are we voting with our time, our money, our commitment, our attention for things that we actually want? Or are we sort of tacit supporters of a vision that's being fed to us that we don't necessarily want to buy into? And the challenge there is that if we are sort of passively accepting what has been given to us, abdicating our responsibility for what comes next comes at a price. It means that we don't get to have a decision in what comes next if we just go with the flow. And the other catch is something that we should all really consider very carefully, particularly in the year 2021, is how once we have advocated our responsibility or passed our option as to what comes next onto a higher power, whether that be a big company or a political leader, it's very hard to claw that responsibility and that ability to direct your own future back 
Unfortunately, authority once given tends to only roll one way, not the other, without some sort of violent revolution, which we also don't really want. So you have to think very carefully. If we don't take that baton as to what comes next, we are effectively abdicating our responsibility to someone else. And that comes with a sort of other catch, which we're going to talk a bit more tonight, in that when we abdicate our responsibility, we give that right and votes, our votes, our say over what comes next to someone else, we're generally giving it to some sort of a, a bureaucrat, someone that doesn't necessarily have the same sort of skin in the game of your future as what you have. And we can look at this from the political sphere, and that our politicians are typically elected on a sort of four or five year cycle. They have very short term bias. They're not incentivized to think about the far future, about intergenerational issues. They're incentivized to get elected in the next cycle. The same thing happens in businesses. It's also something we really have to be aware of as business leaders, and that the most powerful people in the room tend to be the oldest people who tend to also have the shortest term horizon again. Our incentives also all set up around sort of short-term shareholder value cycles, rather than about long-term sustainability and thinking about where we're going. And this is why we are sort of incentivized to build accelerated businesses rather than sort of builder businesses, which is what the world really re needs right now. We don't need another platform. We don't need another software cloud. We need to fix real world problems so right now. We need to fix things like water security and food security and what we're going to do with climate change right now. You know, real problems should be coming first. But instead, we keep on going after the low lying fruit because it does seem to generate more money for us in the short term. But the opportunity is to once again invest and think about building something longer for the long term. And that's where I'm really going to leave you today in that a lot of these problems do come down to people who have been conveniently separated their choices and the consequences thereof. And we hope you're going to talk through our Q&A session today a bit more about how we can start to, to break some of that and change some of these destructive patterns that are trapping us in the present moment rather than thinking proactively about the future. And that's quite a nice from me. Bronwyn. I'm going to ask Bronwyn to stay on stage and um, and first of all thank you for that. I love the way you think, I love the way you assail all well-known and widely held beliefs with impunity and with a lot of courage and I think that's pretty much what defines entrepreneurs. <laughs> so I think that's the sort of spirit that we want to embrace tonight in tonight's conversations and potentially get into some controversial stuff because ultimately that's I think what's required in times like this to poke the bear and stare the dragon down. So with that in mind and, and to the point of uh, fresh new ideas and fresh voices, um, I would like to invite Arlen Culwick onto stage who is a, a fresh voice and a fresh face and somebody that we have not seen on uh, the Heavy Chef stage, so please give a warm welcome to Arlen um, um, And uh, Arlen describes himself as a, a decentralized protocol designer and a philosopher. So that is certainly a very interesting way of describing oneself. And I'm kind of deducing that there is something about blockchain in there, <laughs> which is ultimately one of the most interesting areas and ideas that we can broach and get into and discuss tonight. So, so we're certainly going to open that up. And I, th and I think, um, if, if I may, um, Arlen, just to, to start with, with you and, and, um, and talk around bureaucracy and, and I guess seeing that as it's been teed up so nicely by Bronwyn, to, to get your view on what is trapping us, as we were talking about, and, and what in your view needs to be broken? I know that's an open question, but that I guess opens it up to the work that you're doing. Very broad question. Um, but thanks for having me, and Bronwyn, congratulations on your book. Uh, what is broken? Um, okay, short term, simple answer, um, since we're talking about bureaucracy, I think that bureaucracy is the principal evil in the world today. Um, it's not that difficult to quantify it, but I don't want to, really, don't, don't want to get into details. Um, 
it's not to me just the fact that um, you know it, it takes our choices away from us and it takes personal responsibility away from the kind of vectors in the system who are you know making things happen um, it's about the fact that the centralization of power is no longer necessary we just have better tech we do not have to trust intermediaries we do not have to develop systems that are trust laden so that we are burdened with trusting someone whose incentives need not align with ours it's possible to build things that are decentralized they don't all use a blockchain just in case you're wondering um, and we can make radically better systems as a result it's not it's not easy it's not necessarily obvious either um, but it's doable uh, but to, to take several steps back from just that yeah. if for example you're doing undergrad philosophy um, you're being introduced to the history of ideas you tend to go from Plato and maybe a, just a, the smallest hint of Aristotle all the way through to the modern period so 17th century ish on and there's a like a thousand years of really interesting stuff in just the Western tradition that you don't get and in fact you might find yourself being discouraged from getting into it like I was um, it's really interesting uh, not only do you start seeing the the control technology that today is bureaucracy being developed from the 11th century onwards um, but you also see the same mistakes occurring again and again in the few hundred years building up to the modern period and then just an avalanche of that stuff from the modern period until today um, and those mistakes unfortunately for people who don't do philosophy are, are, are quite abstract they're quite high level so they don't plug in directly to any particular issue but they have names so in case you're interested you might want to look at nominalism nominalism, nominalism is the thesis that um, well relations are mind dependent they're not real as I said quite abstract um, there's another complicated thing called the university of being check out Dan Scotus who was wrong the university <laughs> of, of being, being. Okay. yes being is analogous, it's not univocal. Anyway, that's just my opinion, but you can still look at it. Uh, and there, there are a few other choice abstract things, but as you go into the modern period, you see this, this kind of increase in just those particular ideas leading to unsolvable problems that just recur. They just keep on going, and they sort of take on slightly different forms as one generation sort of pales into the into the next one but you just have the same basic things and so it just sort of compounds until you have this kind of accelerated pace of the same stuff which is broken and never really was fixable because when you frame the problem well you can see that it's not really solvable not without making different assumptions not without approaching things differently um, so it's it's I think the modern period the period we're in now is very broken and we need a fundamentally different approach in order to solve these things that keep coming up. Okay, so, so I think what's, what's happening here is we're starting quite broad, right? And, and I think that's awesome because what you've given us is a sort of broad framework in like, you know, 2,000 years you've kind of brought it back to, to, right, here we are. And we've sat in the last 300 years and we've followed certain ideals and ideas and ideologies which have led us down paths which have broken us. I mean, we have a history, a litany of the past 200 years of where somebody will hold up an idea and then follow it and create a framework that is destructive and destroys people. And we're seeing a little bit of that now with the digital ideals, right? So you're starting to see some of that come through. <laughs> I can see Bronwyn's eyes lighting up because she just wants to jump onto the, the mic and, and, and explain that. But I think the, the reality is, is that life is complicated right and and you can't just put a simple single idea and enforce a society to to follow that because it's so messy i guess so so can can i give you the hospital pass and then say well <laughs> if if you know if it's so broken now then then what is it when we talk about new ideas what does a new good idea look like 
Um, yes, so, so to pick up on what you're saying there, it, it does make a lot of sense that a lot of the problems that we see that are sort of stagnating society are because we get hung up on rules and on particular ways of trying to solve our very messy, very complicated problems. And we try to impose order onto chaotic systems by adding more and more rules. And unfortunately, like I was speaking about earlier, when it comes to things like abdicating authority or your responsibility to authorities, you end up with sort of bigger and bigger, more and more bloated, more and more complicated regulatory and judicial systems that are actually sort of tying us in knots, but needlessly so. So it's almost like a sort of buggy piece of code that we keep on adding more fixes. We never actually fix the underlying thing, which is that we can't really have, at the end of the day, a one-size-fits-all solution to the problem of humanity and society at large. It simply doesn't work that way. Not when that solution is being imposed by one person with one vision onto whatever is going on in the world. And that's sort of key to the thesis of the, the work that, that I'm doing. Like We have to have more flexibility. We don't all want to be making the same mistake. We don't want to be automating if you want to use technology again, we don't want to be automating bad ideas or automating mistakes because then we just have a much more efficient way of making a mess rather than actually solving any particular problems. And I think the, the philosophy of that is very interesting and that's where sort of Arlen's work comes in into trying to find ways to sort of de-bureaucratize society because bureaucracy, whether it is in a corporation or whether it is in a sort of government structure, does stifle growth because we have to sort of squash everything to make sure that things don't run away. We can only sort of add more rules and more borders. We can't actually shape things into, into a, better, a better flow. And unfortunately, most of the best solutions in society do tend to be emergent, but it has to be emergent within a, a structure, at least around the base, because otherwise we have anarchy, which is also what we don't want on the other side. So it's a constant balance <laughs> between trying to I find mean, total disagree. anarchy and like total control. I mean, we don't want literally Wild West with everyone sort of running around with their own private drone. No, they do right. anarchists, though. <laughs> Some of them do. Oh, you they? clearly haven't been on the no, but corners that was of like Twitter. Kids in the on. 70s in England, they <laughs> wanted. Like. No, there's a whole new movement coming up right now. In fact, there's like oh. two different warring schools, like the ones sort of like the techno anarchists, and others the Puritan anarchists that just want to live under the trees. So it's, it's getting it's getting quite okay. intense out there. So, so I'm not I, quite sure we don't want any of that because it's again it's a one size fits all. I, I mean, I, I love the analogy of building something and then it becomes like this bird's nest of code, and it becomes because I, I think mm. like I recognize that. Fix on a fix on a fix. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> like I used to run a digital agency in my previous life, and we used to build these big freaking structures and the problem is is when you build something and then you know the spec gets changed and everything starts to bloat and it just gets freaking it becomes the this massive mess and i know there's some of the ogs in this audience andre john like you guys will know that you build something and it's beautiful and simple and elegant just, and then just it's like you just want to add this feature and this function and whatnot and it just starts to bloat and Ultimately, Andre is nodding his head in the back there. The, the, the challenge here is that, do you then actually just sweep the table clean and say, right, let's start again. And I guess that brings us to what is a decentralized protocol? How and do we do this? And ultimately, how does one design <laughs> such a thing? Oh. Uh, well, there are three steps to it. And if you just follow my opinion, it'll be fine. <laughs> uh, no, no, okay, so... That's why we brought you. <laughs> um, all right, so, oddly enough, I have this other background as a, as a the software architect, or solutions architect in, in corporate speak, um, and I had the, the misfortune of working on a very bloated system for a major retailer who will not be named, and... Um, it was nasty. Um, I think part of the, the, well, the reason I'm bringing this up is um, it is just feature after feature until you have this colossal mess that takes literally millions to, to update or change. Um, but the issue is technical debt there. And by analogy, the issue today is the degree of chaos in our culture. There's so much diversity. And because we've been, well, not everybody, but you know, a lot of the world has been living in democracies. We feel very strongly entitled to an opinion and for our say to have, you know, fair weight. Um, but that tends to create um, a kind of a hyped up version of a typical modern problem, which is um, 
it's easy to come up with a, a, a set of views or theses that aren't reconcilable and you just have an irreconcilable pile of stuff and then you can't really design it in a way that works for everyone. You can't. Um, so to disagree with something you said in your presentation, we can't solve the problem by giving more people a view. But we also, as you say, and which I agree with, we can't solve the problem by giving fewer people a view. Um, I think at least in this particular respect, a way to solve the problem is, is to create what's called a generalized prediction market. Uh, this is a funny thing. If you know about prediction markets, um, you might have heard about them in an occasional news article about someone creating a market to fund the murder of someone. And this is the kind of thing that gets the news. And this is why prediction markets get a really bad rap and why they don't work. Um, now, interestingly, uh, until very recently, all prediction markets were centralized systems. And that created a whole big host of other problems about whether the people maintaining the system could be trusted um, not to do a large number of nasty things. Um, however, there are decentralized prediction markets today, and what they enable um, is essentially a very good oracle system. So most oracle systems are supposed to tell you the truth, and there's a lot of trust packed into that. And oracle is in the company or no, an or oracle that you tells you the truth. You know, okay. you ask it a question, and you get the truth. Yeah. Kind of yeah, yeah. So. Um, instead of needing to trust someone's opinion, there is a, a, an interesting thesis called the wisdom of crowds. It depends upon the crowd not um, being able to collude well. So the, the simple situation, you can't talk about your answer before you give your answer. Um, there are other mechanisms in place in, in decentralized prediction markets that do the same thing effectively. and. Um, allow you to converge quite quickly and with eerie accuracy on the truth on all kinds of matters. Like, who wants to be a millionaire? The best way to get the... Remember, remember that show? Yeah, the, 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 crowd. the crowd was Ask generally crowd. right, right? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah, so you can do this type of thing and they can scale. So in theory, um, when a question is concerned with the truth of a matter, you can go, you can create um, a market for that question and provided there is enough money in it, so people need to put their money where their mouth is and if they're wrong then it costs them money, um, and provided the participation in the market is broad enough, you get uncannily accurate results. These things are more accurate than panels of experts, they're more accurate than uh, scientific research labs, at least answering the specific, the same questions. You know, you, you, the, the divergences of opinion you get from labs of the best people is like, it results in way less accuracy than you get in a prediction market. So that's kind of cool, right? It's, it's, it's a simple enough system to build. You can build it in like nine months, right? It's not that bad. Um, and it allows you to ask questions and get the truth. And it doesn't require everyone having to have a big discussion about how to reconci reconcile their irreconcilable views. And it doesn't require putting any one person in control. It just coordinates your action instead. It's like a way to vote, but without actually voting at the polls over more specific policies. Is that not part of the reason why the network effect works and also why some of the big of you know these big bad wolves that we're speaking of are actually so powerful because they're using those mechanisms to their own benefit, right? Prediction markets, they're not. They're not using data to help them make decisions? Oh, oh in terms of, okay, sorry, I didn't data get the context. Um, because yeah, they, they can be well informed. It's the same mechanism, right? So, okay, it's different, so it's not the same. I, I, want, I want to try and get to a point where it's sort of relevant to, I guess, opportunities and, and, and going forward in terms of what can be broken. If you look at what an entrepreneur does, usually it's break stuff, you know, build something new, test it, build it again, iterate, and, and continue the process until they get to something that that ultimately makes something profitable, I suppose. Okay. And if we look at, at, at this messy world that we live in, right, and it is obviously a very chaotic world. We've just come out of this year of COVID and nobody really understands what's going on. Who knows what the future might hold? Are there any clear opportunities that, I mean, the two of you are sitting with your your roles are really to look at this lens of what's going on 
and to identify all these patterns or at least try to are there any sort of clear things where you go, I mean, I'm, I'm going to tee this up for you, Ronan, where you think, well, you know, if I was an entrepreneur now that had the energy and the wherewithal to do it, this is the market, or these are the markets that I'd, I'd go into. Yeah, well, I'm going to po probably put this question back onto Alan over there, but just sort of set it up a bit more, in that what's, what's happening right now is that we're at this sort of nascent point of building a new sort of way to communicate with each other, much like we were when we had the internet that was opened up, that connected all of us. What happened with the internet as we know it, however, is that quite quickly it became a very centralized system. Right now, if you are a business owner, if you are trying to run an e-commerce store, you have to pay rents and tolls to companies like Amazon and Google to list your product or to serve your ad in order to get access to the global marketplace, which was supposed to be a democratized marketplace that we were all able to connect ourselves with across the world. But all we've effectively done with the sort of internet as we know it is replace the sort of old middlemen with new middlemen. So instead of paying a physical mall landlord a rent to have your shop in his store, you now have to pay Google to make sure that people end up at your digital storefront. And what's happening now is that there's new waves of technology that are re-looking at ways for us to sort of connect with each other, build new ecosystems, build new full global economies that don't replace one sort of middleman or bureaucrat with another one but are actually really decentralized. And that's where things get really, really interesting because it's essentially sort of businesses and ecosystems that are not run by rules. They run rather by emergent behavior of the people that interact with those systems. And that's where the new waves of opportunities are coming from. But also something we have to be concerned about if we are working in the business space in that the, the business models we've just got used to, sort of digitization, mm. sort of the, the wave that we're in right now, is not going to be the same. The way that those connections are made, the way those marketplaces are set up, can be fundamentally rebuilt in very, very different ways. And if we are reliant on those sort of thought third party, as I was saying, the sort of accelerator business platforms, we have to rethink again what's going to happen next and what the implications of a more decentralized, actual peer-to-peer -peer connection network is going to do to our current digital supply chains, very much the same way the internet disrupted physical supply chains as we know it. And that's why I want to pass it on to you to maybe give some more insight into what's Where happening there and whose lunch is being eaten this time. That is that is the question ah, that the I brought you to ask. Yes. They're going to lose their lunch. <laughs> cannot bloody wait. Um, all right. Uh, well, since you, Fred, asked me to speak about opportunity, um, there is tremendous opportunity in this in the decentralization of the internet at every level so right down to you know the basic protocols that will end up powering this thing i i founded a project in 2014 incidentally that provides one of these protocols it's like a, a router for blockchain services and it's kind of very unopinionated so it allows you to learn the truth about all kinds of different things on different blockchains without needing to trust the people supplying you with the information that you use to, to learn the truth, and also without having to download a whole blockchain or several, because they're you know, sometimes terabytes in size and you can't do that, uh, not easily at least. Um, now, that's, that, that's at a very low level, um, but all the way up there are lots of interesting things. But the big difference with this change in terms of opportunity is it's playing a different game. Uh, the, the traditional game that everyone is used to is to find some type of stream of value and then insert yourself into that and then take a piece of that. Um, rent seeking, etc. It's all that type of thing. This breaks these decentralized systems. And when you start doing that, people end up hating you. You might make a bit of money for a little bit, but it doesn't work and then someone will do a cleverer thing that doesn't seek rent and everyone will just use it because the surface is kind of free for the user. Um, and this is an established pattern uh, on the internet. We don't pay to Google something, we just Google it for free. Um, opportunity, right? Easiest way to make money in, in this, this new space is to start printing your own money. Seriously, Literally. it's so easy, it's amazing. <laughs> it's the best thing ever to have happened, right? Um, it's not all that difficult to start your own blockchain. It's quite a lot harder to do something useful with the blockchain, but if you do start a blockchain that's doing something useful, you can then self-fund your operation forever and you can decentralize the decisions that provide the funding. So for example, on the BlockNet blockchain, my own project, every single month 
literally anyone can submit a funding proposal to the network. It's a peer-to-peer -peer network. You broadcast that thing. Um, then the network gets to decide whether they think it's a good idea or not. Um, and once a month, a thing called a super block is, is staked on the network. So there's a new block every minute. One of these every month is a super block. At that block, any of the successful provo proposals who have been voted in have their coins minted at the address in the proposal. So that money never existed before. It didn't require any labor to exploit in order to get it. So it's beautifully clean ethical money. You're not, you don't have to be a capitalist anymore. Um, and then you just do what you said you'd do. And don't be dishonest, otherwise you'll never get funding again. Um, this, is, this is how this system works. <laughs> it's worked incredibly well. I'd encourage everybody looking for a new opportunity to stop exploiting labor and to deal with blockchains instead. Uh, sorry, one. Yeah. Can you ask this question? Balance, can we maybe turn up the microphone rather? Uh, sorry. We can't. Huh. Okay. Good try. One of those <laughs> so speak up. So, um, I'll try. <laughs> yeah, sorry. We, we're trying something new, by the way, just to give you a bit of indication of the tech stuff behind the, the mix. We've got, as opposed to last the, the last event we had, we had these very awkward, scratchy Madonna mics. Now we've got these pickup mics. So the, the flip side of that, as much as it's convenient, we've got to speak up a little bit. Um, okay, so so print your own money, and I think something about that, that just sounds dodgy. Hey, I don't know. You, you asked me to be provocative. I mean, no, no, here no, I am. I, yeah, I think I think this this topic does just lend itself to being provocative. So, and I, I do want to ask the the audience if there are any questions. Yeah, so we're we gonna we're gonna tee it up just now. <laughs> we already got Pia Duplessis in the back. Uh, Pia, go for it. What's your question, my man? Okay, so um, I like to say, uh, so I obviously know Brian and I met you like a couple of months ago. Um, so you would kind for me, when I think about what you're saying, is that to decentralize sort of the system and um, sort of de deconstruct bureaucracy, but at the same time, even kind wants to be a pyramid. Like it, it always sort of it resets into. Mm -hmm. A pyramid that there's somebody at the top with lots of money and there's lots of people at the bottom with nothing, and it seems to be this almost universal kind of construct. And at the same, so these are just a couple of random thoughts. Um, at the same time, it seems like I wonder. Often I wonder if democracy is like the best thing. What makes democracy different from mob rule? And what makes the wisdom of the crowd different from mob rule? Because the wisdom of the crowd elected some interesting people in the last couple of years. And I'm also wondering at the same time whether or not the monarchy is maybe a better system than trying to decentralize all things. Mm. That's a great question. OK, well, I mean, let's open this up to both of you guys. <laughs> and speak your mind. OK. Your, um observation that power tends to centralize um, it's an empirical claim it doesn't mean it's always going to be true and when you look at the ways in which it was possible to coordinate action historically those have been bureaucracy and the other things that came before that which required the centralization of power so I would suggest that in future when um, the technologies that exist now become more widely used, we will see far less centralization of power. And I expect that we'll see a whole lot more animosity toward anyone who acquires a lot of power. It'll just seem wrong because it's no longer necessary and it's not fair. So obviously it's wrong. Right? That's where people's moral intuitions will go. Um, I, it sounds like from the second part of your question, like I didn't explain what the wisdom of crowds is. It's not similar to mob rule. It's not similar to voting. Um, the wisdom of crowds, it requires you to put your money where your mouth is. So let's say you all, um, you all have to put down like 2,000 Rand um, on some opinion, right? Uh, maybe let's say it's, make it really simple. It's a, it's a yes or no answer. If you're wrong, you lose your two thousand rand, and someone else gets it. You could be callous about it if you want, but if you're going to play the game, you're going to do your research and try hard to get the right answer, 
And what that does is it means that um, it's pretty obvious when you graph the responses what the right answer most likely is. Um, so what, in other words, what I'm saying is that the 2,000 Rand aspect, that um, essentially makes people take responsibility for their decision. It means that they have to do their research or it's going to hurt. Um, so in other words, it's not like a vote um, where the consequences are sort of far off or probably zero or something. It's not, a, it's not trying to measure everyone's current opinion. It gets you to work to try to figure out what the truth of it is. And then when you, when you graph the distribution of the results, it emerges very clearly. Brian? Yeah, so to pick up on what you're saying there, Pierre, when it comes to sort of whether sort of monarchy or democracy makes sense, I think the first thing we have to realize is that democracy as we know it isn't actually democratic. Like democracy is supposed to be ruled by the people for the people. What we have is essentially is a monarchy, but we just get to choose our king every four years, right? So we're not actually getting to choose how things work. We're just, gonna, we're just getting to choose who to delegate our power to. That's what democracy has been. It's been a flawed system, but it's a better system, of course, than having a sort of entirely top-down totalitarian rule. As old Churchill said, you know, it's the best flawed idea that we've managed to come up with for large groups of people to get some form of at least pseudo sort of consensus as to what's going on. But now we have more opportunities when it comes to things like what's going on with decentralized technology for us to be more involved as individuals in actually governing actual decisions. So taking responsibility for our own, putting our own voice, using that whole sort of wisdom of the crowds thing to find commonality, but around specific points of order, rather than just picking a king every four years. There's a distinction there. However, there's also an argument to be made that that's, that's talking about now of like nations and, and civilization and large, large groups of people. There's a different conversation to be had when we start talking about leadership in the business space. Bureaucracy is still the problem there because these systems are sort of run on, as they say, sort of organizational cholesterol. We've set up systems that end up sucking a lot of value out of society. But when it comes to leadership itself, there is a good argument to be made that a good king, in other words, a sort of a corporate dictator, someone with a particular vision, will go farther in building an actual sort of builder business, like I was talking about earlier, rather than an accelerator type business, which might be able to operate with a more democratized sort of corporate structure. So I think we do have to have different conversations around sort of how private entities are run and how public entities are run and how what is efficient and effective when it comes to actually sort of, you know, dominating your marketplace and all the rest. But to tie that conversation together again, so what Alan was saying is that in a more sort of decentralized, a truly decentralized rather than a sort of pseudo Western democracy version of decentralization that we have right now, community, those distinctions are going to largely fall apart in that when you have a very decentralized, larger society, if we are able to run, as Alan is saying, without having to sort of part, cast your votes every four years and rather have more emergent consensus, you probably won't want to tolerate really, really big, massive platform-based businesses that are effectively operating, as a lot of people know and a lot of media commentators have said over the last few years, as kind of de facto governments over our lives, operating as rent seekers and toll collectors and all the rest of it. So we have to understand that if we fix sort of democracy and social consensus, we're going to have to relook at what corporations are. And a corporation right now is kind of an island. You know, you have shareholders and you have people. But we're moving into a world where it doesn't have to work that way, where corporations can be themselves more emergent and less sort of closed as they are right now. And it all goes together. And that's not to say it's all good or it's all bad, but it is a shift that we're starting to see that we have to get our heads around if we are entrepreneurs that want to succeed as the world pro progresses. I'm going to quickly take an a, 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 a virtual audience question and then we're going to move to a question in the, in the physical audience. But um, like a little nugget quickly, what is an NFT? Why should we care? <laughs> <laughs> you do that one. Go Whoa, first. the hype is strong these days. <laughs> <laughs> NFTs are not new. It stands for non-fungible token, but it actually goes back to 2014 when someone coined the phrase proof of existence. Um, proof of existence was first done on the Bitcoin blockchain because there weren't all that many other secure chains out there at the time. And um, 
essentially what you do is you take any digital object, a document, a photograph, whatever, um, a tweet. you produce essentially a fingerprint of that document, it's called a cryptographic hash, um, and then you create a certain kind of transaction. Um, it's, it's got a field called an op return field. You can Google op underscore return if you're interested. It's quite boring. Um, but essentially you, you, you throw that, that fingerprint into the op return field and you broadcast that on to, to the Bitcoin network. Eventually, unless you made a mistake, it'll find its way into the blockchain. At that point, you have a timestamp, right? Because there's a record which is essentially immutable on a blockchain um, that records the time at which that fingerprint was committed. So at any given point later, someone could change a single character in your document and it won't have the same cryptographic hash, the same fingerprint as it did when you hashed it. So it's a really, really nice way of proving whether something has been modified. It's also a really nice way of, um, of proving that it existed. So if I go, you know, in 20 years from now, I produce the same document, you can go and you can, you can create a fingerprint and it'll create the identical fingerprint that is already on the blockchain. And you can go, oh, all right, that proves that this existed back then. That's proof of existence. Now an NFT is basically the same thing. Um, just with some standards about how it behaves when you interact with, with it and with other contracts on a blockchain. Um, so people are using it for art and stuff now because artworks are supposedly unique and that makes it kind of useful. So if I, if I make a dirty scribble in my notebook and then I photograph it and then <laughs> hash it and then put it on a chain, um, that's, that could be an NFT. The and then if I, if I like throw the, you know, give, give you the piece of paper or something. That's not the same as owning it because um, owning. ownership is, is, is separable from possession, right? Like if, if I steal your house, it's still legally your house. It's just that I'm like preventing you from coming into it, right? And that's mine now that's in that possession. other sense. But you own the house. I'm possessing the house. So in the same way, um, people are selling artworks on blockchains because they know that there's a very strong case to be made for ownership when you produce an NFT, but not for possession. They'll, they'll put a JPEG of the art, artwork on their website and anyone can have it, you know. So yeah. in simple terms, it's literally just a proof of ownership? Yeah. Obviously, yeah. Okay. But imaginary bit. Good. <laughs> we have a question in the crowd. Um, Alex. Um, I understand this a lot of thoughts and it's really great. I, I'll disagree with you there. Um, wisdom of crowds does not require broad participation. It requires a certain minimum threshold of participation to be reached before you have... But then the crowd is No, 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 no. Wait, hold on. It, it, to find... It, wait, you're misunderstanding something, I think. The wisdom of crowds isn't a vote. It's not a representative uh, view of the majority. Voting is a separate thing. Um, wisdom of crowds is about determining the truth about something. So, uh, you know. In order to determine the truth about something, you have to participate. And participating 
Participation is a luxury. Okay. Hang on. I think we're getting to we're getting to the point. You've already said that. I am saying that the mechanism for the wisdom of crowds to find the truth does not require many participants. So you can learn the truth even if you know fifty people participate. Um, and that the truth is I mean that in a strong sense, the actual truth of an of a decidable question. It's not just opinion. You find the truth about things. Right? Now this is separate from voting. So if you need not to find the truth, but to find what everybody's average preference is, then you need everybody to vote, ideally. And that's a completely different situation. There's a different challenge there. Uh, when you want to decentralize a voting system, you need to solve what's called the Sybil problem, um, which is preventing people from impersonating others or voting twice. Um, and that's quite a difficult problem. Um, uh, but I do want to say that you're absolutely right about the difficulties of enabling access, especially in very unequal societies. On the other hand, I don't think those sorts of challenges are particularly hard for a committed, well-funded startup. Definitely a pretty hard challenge for a crumbling bureaucracy. But uh, yeah, I don't know. Um, I also have a challenge with this topic, is that this topic is an event on itself. So I don't want to get too embroiled in that, and I would rather suggest Alex chat to Alan afterwards, because this is like half an hour with a, or an hour and a half with a glass of wine, or two, or three, and you're going to get, we're going to go down a rabbit hole. So David, question for you from you. So, yeah, I'm, I'm listening to both of you, and I'm going along with some other voters and counting, and my problem is, It's not the, the, these systems don't try prevent communication. The, the, the framework where it was proposed that people can't communicate um, before they give their opinion um, is a kind of an idealized scenario that comes from the literature. But in the, in the actual implementations, it comes down to putting your money where your mouth is. So you can ask me about what I think and anyone else and you can Google it and it kind of doesn't matter how much communication you do because it, the, you know, when, it, when it comes down to it, it's your money and you don't want to be wrong because you'll lose your money. Yeah, and if you're in doubt, you're not going to risk your money. You're going to try generally to become extremely confident before even entering the market. So in, in practice, you just have like 99.9% .9 of the people saying the same thing every time, which is a great guide to truth because <laughs> you're not going to risk it, right? It's a really, really interesting dynamic. Okay, I, I, have, a, I have a few questions from uh, the virtual audience. One on which, because I'm going to, I think there's a lot of topics that can get quite nebulous and we can get into a lot of, you know, it's, those are such vast topics. So to bring it back into um, some practical stuff, and I think some of the, the questions that have been consistently fielded in Heavy Chef events in the past, and particularly in the Kailicha events that we've held and so on is, is around the, the idea of data, right? And it, and it does kind of connect to some of the things that we've spoken about in inequality and, and there's this disproportionate access and there's a stranglehold on data. I mean, I, I know this is probably an impossible question to ask, but I'm gonna put it on the table anyway. But is there a future that we foresee where data will be more democratized? Do we have you know, something in the near future whereby everybody in this country, which will open up so many opportunities, and we know this through the people that we've engaged with in our communities at Heavy Chef, certainly. Um, I mean, do, is this a reality? Um, well, it could be a reality depending on how we pressure our legislators and our regulators to actually open up access to that sort of data. But we need to preface that and to say that data is not the solution to all of our problems and in fact we don't we don't live in a world where lack of information is a particularly huge problem and there was quite an interesting case study that I was reading this week about exactly that about a retail chain in the UK 
that had so much data, but they became paralyzed with that data. They had access to all the most amazing data through the most fancy speed points possible at all their till points, across all these stores and all their locations. But they were unable to actually actualize that. And what the, the, the incoming sort of leadership team did is they took that all away. They just left everyone with an old fashioned till and a piece of paper to sort of write down customer issues. And they were able to solve a whole lot more of their problems. Well, that's quite a silly example, but it does get us to think when we sort of outsource again our decision making as entrepreneurs, as individuals, as businesses to big data and somehow think that big data is going to sort of solve those problems, that more information is going to give us a better answer, it's not necessarily true. There is a lot to be said about small data too that actually gives us more insights on what's going on and that's actually not easier for anyone to, to really gather. So we shouldn't see that as necessarily being a stumbling block to access to real opportunities. Data is quite good at sort of spotting patterns, but it's not necessarily very good at solving real specific problems. The other catch, of course, is that data is only as good as what has been inputted into all the various different fields. And if we're trusting data simply because it is big and there are flaws in that data, we can make very, very dangerous decisions. And that's where a lot of the issues with things like the emerging technology, where it gets very, very scary, and things like artificial intelligence, and things like predictive policing, and predictive health scores, become very, very problematic when we're relying on big data, we're sort of locking it into the system, using it to make decisions, but they're the wrong decisions. And what's more dangerous there is that we're confident in those wrong decisions because the data that went into them is so big. So I would, I would say that perhaps that's the, maybe the wrong question to be asking. Just to clarify, I think the question was more around access to bandwidth and data as well, opposed like, to actual. data bytes and oh. ones and zeros. So that's, a, that's, a, that's an interesting question, but it's a question that's really being solved quite quickly. We are able to give everyone, if we wanted to, free data if we had the will for it. It's not a real problem, it's almost like a political problem right now with the sort of satellite internet structure structures can you define the problem have? just so we understand because mm. i think there are some people in the audience here and certainly some of the virtual audience like we don't know why the hell the gateways have not been open I and mean, we spoke a lot about gatekeepers and the fact that there's bureaucracy there but that exactly. is the yeah. single most bullshit bureaucracy ever the fact that we've got nearly 60 million people in this country and very few of us actually have access to you know, this practically free source. Well, we've taken a common good, which is like spectrum in the sky, which doesn't really belong to any one person, but it is issued by a central monopoly, that would be the government, that issues those licenses. And they issue those licenses and we've effectively created an oligarchy, right, that gets to set its own pricing. But we forget that when we sort of granting monopoly licenses to private companies, we're essentially sort of selling public goods for private profit, which is something that we should all be sort of pushing back against. These are exactly the sort of problems about bureaucracy that we're talking about that is strangling progress across the world. So it's a great example of exactly that. And it's a very sort of simple switch that either you have to sort of, if you're giving away monopoly licenses to a scarce common good, there has to be some sort of quid pro quo for the society that's so what is the up. answer to that? Because then you have these huge big corporations. So is it anarchy to an extent? Is it disruption? Is it like some startup coming through with a new idea and new technology? I think they're, they're, they're deeper questions to be had there about how we deal with common goods. And I think that that underlies a lot of the conversations we're having here, but in much simpler terms. Things like everything, whether you're talking about freedom of speech, whether you're talking about access to scarce speak spectrum, whether you're talking about privacy, these are common goods problems that if you get something, I kind of lose out. And common goods in terms of the sort of tragedy of the commons means that everyone ends up losing if you have complete anarchy, but at the same time, if you give special privileges to a small bunch that aren't paying fairly for those special privileges, then you end up with monopolies and inequality. That's where a lot of inequality comes from, is unfair licenses over monopolies. Even something as simple as sort of property rights, is a sort of micro-monopoly that's being handed out. And these are problems with the systems and the bureaucracies that we have that we can actually change. They can be changed by a simple change of the law if citizens like you and I don't like it, if we understand the problem enough to articulate it, we can demand change in those in those spaces. And we know we can. Like mass movements actually do work if we sort of demand that this is no longer acceptable. Okay, so I've got another question from virtual audience, which is, it, it seems super obvious and, and actually I kind of like it, is if we talk around Bitcoin, right, and the fact that it's just so wildly in our face at the moment, 
And I have an issue with this because the truth is, it, it seems so spurious. It's like, why is it going up and down? You know, Elon Musk sends a freaking tweet and now suddenly it's worth this. You know, you can buy a Tesla with Bitcoin. So all of a sudden, the price of Bitcoin goes up by, you know, into the stratosphere. But who the hell is going to buy a Tesla with their Bitcoin? Nobody, because it doesn't make sense. Like they know that they're losing more than actually they're gaining with the, the yeah, They could buy two vehicle. Teslas in two weeks time. In two weeks time. And they're contributing <laughs> to the fact that the Bitcoin is, is increasing in value just by relinquish, relinquish, relinquishing it. And so, so what is can the question? we explain what the hell is going on? Is this sentiment, is there utility uh, in it? And, and should- You're asking should me to give away my trade it? secrets here. Come on. Should, should we buy a Bitcoin? No, I'm joking. But I mean- <laughs> Should we buy? Not? <laughs> yeah, I'm not answering the question of whether we should buy, but I can give an, uh, a brief explanation of the fundamentals of Bitcoin, which I hope more people know about, but it, it's surprising. I don't really see this often, especially in bull markets where there's a ton of noise. The way I understand Bitcoin is it's fundamentally about supply side economics. So there's something really beautiful in the way that it's built. Um, there is a, a certain maximum number of coins that will ever exist. And there is a monetary policy so to speak. Every time a miner mines a new block, there is a block reward. Now that block reward is given approximately every 10 minutes with a little adjustment that runs on the protocol to ensure that it's always about 10 minutes. Um, and every four years, that block reward halves. All right, so you have this pretty predictable issuance of new coins every 10 minutes, halving every four years up to a probabilistic maximum of 21 million. Now, that should mean that roughly every four years, the price is going to double, right? Because it's the same amount of energy and capital um, put into your mining operation, provided mining, your, your mining operation doesn't grow, um, that will now be receiving half the number of coins, right? So supply side economics, it's going to need to be double for you to break even and keep going, right? Um, now, uh, in addition to that dynamic, the total number of what's called, well, the amount of hash rates, so that the total mining power um, committed to mining Bitcoin hasn't stayed the same ever. It just keeps going up because uh, the big miners are investing as much as they can afford to, to design better miners. So miners that use less energy for more hashes. Um, and of course they're buying making as many miners as they possibly can, mining devices, so that they can just mine more Bitcoin. Right? And, um, that basically means that instead of, you know, X amount of capital at, you know, time A and time B, uh, at time B we're seeing sort of 10X amount of capital being invested in that same block solution. And so in order to just break even, the price needs to be, you know, kind of 10 times higher. So what this tends to produce, um, if you graph it is okay if you have linear scales so uh, left to right <laughs> then it'll just look like an exponential curve it just goes crazily up now if you then put the price chart on a log 10 scale you will have something that looks kind of like this it sort of tails off with time um, which means that the, you know it's the rate of increase is decreasing and then if you put the time frame also on a log 10 scale, you have a linear relationship. It just, you just draw a band and it just goes inside the band. And it, it, at the same time, if you look at it, it's still dropping by 85% in, in the bear markets and then you know, going up to the moon every, every bull market. But I've lived and worked through several of these now and it's the same thing every time. You, you always have the news latching onto people like Elon Musk or different characters in different markets, but it's the same nonsense. But basically I think we're kind of inside of this band and the miners that are a little bit weak sort of die off but the ones that can survive break even or make in times like these huge profits but you basically see the supply side thing carrying on and then the demand is just speculative so it can just waver like crazy so Brian, do you have anything to that's add my to sketch that? 
basically it's a it's, it's a sort of the flip side of the sort of the wisdom of crowds you've also kind of got the madness of crowds these cycles of self-reinforcing so it's sort of like you know success breeds success and failure breeds failure what we do have to understand about things like cryptocurrencies is they're not backed up by military force like most of the money that we actually live and get to work and play with today which means that the price is driven by behavior by both demand and supply side behavior that is by people like you and i and we are very mimetic as human beings that if i'm into something you're going to want to be into that same thing that's how fashions work that's how trends work that's how a lot of the our desire works and these systems have value because we believe they have value and once we believe they have value and we bought into them we have a a very strong incentive to get someone else to reinforce the fact that they have value. So they are very, very human systems that mimic our general human behavior. And that's the best way to understand them. They have value because we want them to have value and because we rely on each other's sort of association of what value is in order to drive our behavior. As we're coming to the end of the event, I want to open it up to the crowd if there are any other questions. I do have a question around looping it back to the ideas and particularly ideas that hopefully I don't know are there any ideas that can resolve the gross inequality and and we'll touch upon some maybe something a bit controversial but is there anything lastly from okay we have a question there yeah, just a question in terms of like the future thinking like, like it seems like there's a lot of potential future obviously but it seems as though even in the very near term it's very unlikely that we know which one is this not maybe a function of like the fact that there are now seven and a half billion of us? Right? I mean, we are we're literally running through um, iterations here. I mean, the, the Roman Empire at its peak had 50 million people. There are more people in South Africa. Right? So I mean, we're, we're really like iterating over a lot more stuff. The other thing might be that a lot of our work is now information. So we don't necessarily see skyscrapers go up and this kind of stuff. I mean, we see actually very complex systems being built. But we can't directly account for We don't necessarily see them uh, physically. Um, so, so my question is, is, is that a potential, like, for why it's, um, it's an obvious case and not even certain what's going to happen? And the second thing is just in terms of, like, building a system, I, I think a lot of what came out here is, like, definitely one size fits all is going to be problematic. Is it just saying that, well, just build whatever system you like, just allow people to opt out peacefully? Isn't that more of an ideal thing? People can run the UAE the way they want to run the UAE. Yeah, that would that would sort of mirror my thinking about life in general. That we have to have opt outs. That if you like have to fall in line with someone else's view as what is perfect, what is utopia, and of course we're going to have a lot of very very unhappy people because we have very very different ideas, you, me, and everyone else in this room about what's actually a good life to live. We have different value systems. We try and impose sort of subjective value systems on everyone else around us. We make ourselves happy at the sort of expense of everyone else. What you're saying about with regards to complexity is also entirely correct. The more of us there are, humans do drive change. We drive progress too, or at least we should, if we are all able to act as independent agents in a system. When we are trying to be imposed, like we said, according to a particular set of rules that's imposed on all of us, we don't get the benefit of that progress and that change that comes from the dynamic, sort of wonderful, chaotic thing that human society really is, and we try and suppress that. But you know, these are complicated solutions. There is no one sort of formula as to, as to sort of how we fix this, but we shouldn't allow complexity and sort of chaos to slow us down in terms of where we are headed. We should see that as an advantage, not as a disadvantage. And there's very good data that can back that up. And societies with growing populations are more prosperous. They, that's where progress comes from, that when we start to have stagnating populations, we see across much of the world what's going on with the demographic shifts from youthful to more aged populations, that's when progress tends to slow down and society, much like human beings in our own individual life, life cycles, we sort of start off being more progressive, taking more risks, and we get a bit older, we become a bit more conservative. The same sort of cycles do apply to society, and then sort of progress and growth shifts to different parts of the world. Now, as you're saying, as long as we have different sort of groups of societies like that, we're able to still have progress, at least in some pockets. But the danger, of course, is when we sort of homogenize absolutely everything and we kind of all stagnate at around about the same time. That's the flip side risk of things like globalization. We have efficiencies and economies of scale, but we trade off a lot of our resilience and also a lot of our ambition as societies. That's what we need to guard against. We need to, we need to be 
progressive about progress itself. We mustn't sort of get to a point where we're scared of any sort of change because change is generally good. I mean, like a complete lack of change is literally what the definition of death is, right? So <laughs> Zombiehood. Yes. Stagnation. Zombies. Again with the zombies. <laughs> but oh, what? Where did we? Tell me about zombies. <laughs> Starts here today, tonight. I, I want to quickly end off. We started the talk around ideas and radical ideas. We need new ideas. I mean, we're living in this. I mean, Alex uh, referred to it, but we we have this disproportionate society where there's these you know inequalities that are radical, and it's just getting. If, if, according to you know what we're told, it's getting worse, right? So. Ultimately, that's a challenge that certainly doesn't seem sustainable, and it's it's something that we see on our doorsteps, and particularly in Africa, we are confronted. So we cannot sit in a, uh, you know, in an ivory tower in a, in a glass bubble. Or we can't sit behind screens and just pretend that it's not existing, right? So we do need some fresh ideas in order to to lean into this. I mean, you kind of alluded to it, and we certainly back the idea that entrepreneurs can actually resolve a lot of that by rolling up their sleeves, implementing ideas, and getting stuck in, right? Can you talk to some of that? Can you talk to some of the ideas, potentially, that you're aware of, or that you, you might have heard of? I mean, we can talk about UBI, which <laughs> I Ooh. think is a little, that's probably a whole event on its own. But just to mention, I know that you are not a huge fan of UBI, but uh, but it has been bandied around as a, as a simple idea that could be trans you know transferred into the society. Um, but do you have something something that we could leave upon potentially yeah. something useful? Yeah, exactly. I mean, like inequality is definitely one of the biggest issues that I look at. And what's happened over the last years, we've seen inequality accelerating, inequality between big and small businesses, inequality between poor and rich, inequality between poor and rich nations. And when you really look at the question of inequality, and I'm trained in economics, so I like have an understanding of what, what this is, when we sort of unpack the lid of what's going on underneath inequality, a lot of it comes down to monopolies. Like some people having control over access to resources or, or to power, so that's monopolies over power or over money, that is essentially sort of protecting that group from other people breaking into it. So we can take an example, even something as simple as say hairdresser licenses. Like if you're not allowed to cut hair unless you've got a license, that's a monopoly that creates a sort of barrier to entry and it's an artificial barrier to entry. The most controversial one would of course be in the South African context, property rights themselves. Like by granting people private property rights, we're essentially creating micro monopolies over those pieces of property. That's why the land question is so big here, because fundamentally people do understand that that's the sort of source of all these inequalities. And those are the questions we need to be sort of attacking. So we sort of titled this whole thing about sort of breaking down bureaucracy, but another way to look at it is breaking down monopolies and actually saying that that's no longer acceptable in a world where there's other ways to allocate resources. And as South Africans, we should definitely know this. Like, for example, for the longest time, you know, electricity production had to be a monopoly because that's the only way to effectively distribute electrical grid to everyone in the population. But now if we're able to generate our own electricity using things like solar panels, that monopoly is no longer necessarily justified. So if we can reduce the price of electricity and the cost on the environment by sort of literally decentralizing that and taking away a lot of that monopoly power, that puts literal power into many, many more people's hands directly. So that's just one example. So look for where the monopolies are and we want to sort of break those down or not accept them, we will fix a lot more inequality a lot quicker. So we have to do that as long as we allowing artificial monopolies to add dead weight loss to our societies at large, inequality perpetuates in a monopolistic type society. So that's that's the sort of first places we, we should be looking there. And there are there are some quite interesting examples, I'm sure you know some from, from your work of how that's being broken down. That's what we talk about. We talk about literally decentralizing things should be on the agenda of anyone care that really cares about inequality as a problem. I've just been thinking about UBI. Um, we can come back to that. Oh, it's so nice. Uh, <laughs> so I'm quite glad that you agreed in a conversation we had a while back that decentralized UBI OBI. would yeah <laughs> would be would be great. Um, 
Now, it's occurred to me that a, 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 a really beautifully anarchic way of creating equality would be to see wh whether you can foster grassroots economies using a coin that is minted at the addresses of a number of participants every day. So UBI, hi, here's your free coins. Every day there's going to be like a set number of coins. Now you can go spend them, right? Um, I like it because it takes power away from the central bank and the other banks. I like it because it puts the power in the hands of the people using the coin. I like it because it doesn't require anybody's permission. Um, and I like it because people who might be extraordinarily poor get free money. So what's not to love? It's fantastic, provided that it is a decentralized system. And fortunately, these systems actually exist. There's several of them out there. I use one of them. It's quite fun. I just get more coins every day. Um, so I don't know what could be more disruptive to bureaucracies and uh, would level the playing field better than a bunch of people who don't typically have access to resources, aren't on the nasty side of a monopoly, suddenly having money that the other people on, in, the, in power don't really have because they just don't use it. And you maybe there'll be situations where they just don't accept trade in rands. They're just not interested in that nasty monopoly money, excuse the pun, but they can now start using real decentralized equitable money. So it certainly seems like the future is going to be messy and there's going to be lots of tectonic It's going to be messy no matter that, what. That We're just going to create to be, good mess. There's going to be pushing pushback against you know these various titanic systems that are, are... And then I think there's going to be these anonic, anarchic idea, idealists and people who... Um, uh, <laughs> I don't know what this is. Is this from... Is this from Roxy? Okay, gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. Um, so, and I think out of that, out of that chaos, and that actually is, there's precedent through history, through chaos and through revolutions, whether it's an industrial revolution, whether it's a like political revolution, whether it's a violent uprising, whatever it may be, that out of that, there is, there is some pretty good technology, there's good ideas, there's good systems, and there's good people that, that arise from them. So, so I, I think that there is a lot to be hopeful for. Um, I think there's a lot of ideas that can be gleaned from all of this chaos. There's a lot of complexity. A lot of that shit I do not understand. <laughs> I must be honest. But the reality is there's a lot of smart people out there that are grappling with these things and, um, and creating systems and structures and enterprises and, uh, and startups that are leaning into these problems. So. What I really love about these kinds of conversations and essentially what we're trying to do with these, what we call inspire sessions, is literally just that, to inspire thought, to inspire thinking, to inspire dialectic and discourse. And, and through these types of things and hopefully with a bit of Baxberg wine, you know, a little bit of the seeds will be planted for the revolution and for these ideas to, to, to bear fruit. Um, so I would encourage all of you guys to come back again to be brave and get out into the wild again to get away from your screens come and speak to real people i'm going to attend another heavy chef when you do have the chance um, uh, i want to first of all just before i sign off and say cheers to everybody online and to you guys uh, just a massive thanks once again to the team to Zhuzha, to randall to siobonga to um, to Vaynant over there um, and, uh, and to the team in Joburg, Kanye and Louis, uh, as well as our mascot running around there, that little voice that you hear, Nali, she pretty much runs all of our meetings. Um, that's Marby's, <laughs> Marby's little one. She's part of the Heavy Chef family. And, um, and thank you to you guys for coming out, getting in the mix, supporting us, and getting involved. Um, stick around, have a glass of wine. Thank you to Bronwyn and Arlen for a stimulating conversation and uh, for getting the juices flowing. That was amazing. Thank you, guys. Hello, guys. Ooh. Nice. Well done. Well done. Thank you. That was great. Fun. Yeah, that was good fun. Yeah.
Yeah, I think there's a lot of stuff we could get into. Yeah, Feel free to pester Ireland and Brian.